Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. Our guest for this episode of Healing Ties 2.0 is award-winning author Trish Lobb. Trish's expertise is derived from the full-time care of her parents, one with Alzheimer's and one with stage 4 cancer, for whom she delivered the care and end-of-life wishes they desired. Her award-winning Comfort in Their Journey book series provides the clear, concise, and Easily accessible information she wished had been available to her on her care journey with her parents. Let's enjoy a cup of comfort with Trish, and I'll see you on the other side of the show. Well, greetings, Trish, and welcome to this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. It is a delight to visit with you today. Well, it's an honor to be here, so thank you for inviting me. You know, what's so fun about this vast network of caregivers is you get to meet people uh, in most cases, who you wouldn't really have that opportunity because our, we met through two mutual friends who I had just recently met. And here we are, long lost friends after, what, a, a couple of months. Right, right. That is one of the best parts of this. It is. But, you know, I, as I'm prone to do with all my guests, Trish, how are you creating healing ties? Okay. Um I kind of start kind of at the delivery of that. I create healing ties by working with people like you, um, networking and, and referring people to the person I think they might be the best fit with. But, um, you know, I came from two and a half years of overseeing and managing the daily care and the medical care um, and being in the trench as a hands a real hands-on caregiver. Um, I managed a care team, an in-home care team of nine people on the schedule in a week and was the, the designated substitute as well. And that care was for my dad who lived with Alzheimer's likely 20 years and my mom who lived was, was diagnosed with um, stage four cancer, colon cancer, and lived another couple of years. And um, to make, just to kind of give you a little snippet of that, you know, my family was super healthy. We didn't spend any time in hospitals. I think my mom had her gallbladder out once. My dad had, a, I don't know, some angioplasty or something like that. So when all of this kind of blew up into medical crisis, we were prepared in one way. My parents had done some planning. But for going into the medical system and the care systems, <laughs> we didn't have a clue. I mean, we, I, we didn't even know what a hospitalist right. was. And they'd been around a while. We just didn't have that experience. And so we were kind of um, clueless to say the least. We were, you know, skilled at researching things, but we had to spend a lot. And when I say we, it was my mom caring for my dad and then my sisters and I caring for both of them. Um, I didn't do this solo by any means, but we had to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. We amassed an incredible amount of information. Um, you know, sometimes we would, it, when we were in crisis, one of my sisters or I, or I would do 36 hour shift, go home and research for eight more hours because we had to teach ourselves. And I found right. that, um, there were a couple challenges in particular, and these are ways I'm hoping to help people, uh, with healing ties is that, um, first of all, I think caregiving is very unique in the sense that it really requires you go into multiple arenas and that's, you know, medical care, legal, um, insurance, sometimes long-term care, different arenas, and each of them has its own language. And so exactly. we were struggling to learn the lexicon that belonged to each of, each of them. And I think the second thing was that I didn't learn until my journey with that, my parents, and I've had journeys with other people as well, but my initial one was with my parents, that um, somebody said to me once, well, you know, there's thousands of books and hundreds of organizations. Well, that's lovely. But number one, I didn't have time to find them. Number two, I didn't have time to find them and sort through and find out which one had the answers I needed. And I needed e easily accessible, quickly accessible, actionable information. So um, and I'm happy to go into more detail on any of this, but to make a very long story short, after my parents passed, people started asking me to do one of two things, write books or do what I had done for my parents for their family. So as you can imagine, the ones who asked me to do it for their family, I'm like, mm, no. I'm still way too tired. A couple books on a different topic, and I knew what that required. And 
you know, to make a long, long story short, one day I just realized I couldn't throw everything we had learned away. And I recognized right. that um, one of my sisters in particular and I have kind of specialized skill sets that allow us to research stuff pretty quickly. And I thought, what about mm -hmm. the people who don't have that skill? What are they going to do? How are they going to find the answers? I mean, I would walk into a hospital, a doctor would look at me and ask a life and death question and expect an answer in a half an hour. So the bottom line is, um, how am I uh, making healing ties? I wrote a three book series um, called It's a Comfort and Journey is my business and it's a Comfort and Journey book, book series. I'm happy to go into that, you know, what those are later. Um, and I go out and work with people based on the content in those books. For me, those, the books are reference books so that somebody can go in. I had a, my, my closest friend called me one day a couple years ago and she said, my husband just came home with oxygen. I said, page 264, book three, just read two paragraphs, that's it. So I know that was kind of a rambling okay. explanation, but my, my connecting with Healing Ties is to put information out there, easily accessible, to be available to right. people, to help them learn what you need to thrive instead of just barely hang on and survive through the process because you can thrive through the process you can thrive through the process with the proper tools mm -hmm. and the proper uh, comfort in your journey yeah. because uh, you know we're all you know we're in after caregiving per se but we're still involved because we've been in the trenches we understand and we want to share our experiences and that's kind of what we do here in the whole care network because we believe it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause and that's why it's so fun to connect with other caregivers because we can share this vital information and if we know that we're just even if we know we're hitting just one person we're helping one right. person there's there's some benefit to that. Absolutely. And I think I just had this epiphany while you were talking. I think there's so much value, of course, storytelling. You know, that's something that supports entire cultures, and it's been a little weak in our culture lately. But I think it's coming back, and, and right. that's the way you connect with somebody. And I think it's also, I just realized, it's people like you and me and, and Judy and Susie all standing up saying, we've, we've done this. We've seen this. We've helped people do mm -hmm. this. It's going to be okay. We, you know, there's a whole army of people standing there. This is what I didn't realize. There's a whole army of people out there standing there just waiting to shore people right. up. Put their hands out, you know, on their back, their shoulder blades, and just hold them there steady and, and let them know they're okay. And it's really quite a remarkable thing. It's, it's not unlike any other industry, if that's what you want to call it, that I've worked in. People are really just there to help. Exactly, because that, yeah, cause that, that, that industry per se usually happens you you get introduced to the industry mm -hmm. <laughs> in the middle of a crisis absolutely an emergency and uh i've not uh, again I, my, my listeners are going to say he's going to say it again but i am going to say it again because i probably haven't said it to you <laughs> uh, i've not uh, uh i've not want, met one person that's had caregiving on their bucket list of things to do in life amen Amen. Uh, but I, I, I have to preface that because I, I did get a, <laughs> I got a note from a listener not too long ago, within the last couple of weeks, and he, he said, you know, I know you use a lot of mantras on your, on your podcast, but I want, I want you to know that uh, I selected caregiving because my partner, my, my spouse, was, was ill before, uh, a, a, as we were courting each other. So let's put a whole that that that's, that's for a topic yeah. for another podcast. But uh, it, it, there are some people that do select it, yes. But for the most part, yeah. you know, caregiving happens because of a unplanned, uh, you know, an unfortunate accident or an untimely diagnosis, and you're thrust into this, trying to find all this information when you're in an emotional dither. And I so agree with you. I I always knew that if my parents ever needed care, I wanted to provide them. It was a choice for me to do that. Right. Now, my preference for them would have been that they simply went to sleep one day. Not, not so that I didn't have to do the caregiving, but so that they didn't have to go through what they went through. So was it on my bucket list? No. Mm -hmm. Was it a choice? Yeah. What, did I go into that happily to do that? Of course, but it wasn't on my bucket list. You know? <laughs> right. It wasn't, it, it wasn't something that 
you plan to research no. before it happened. No, and you know, I think there's so many times in life where people say, you know, plan for this or plan for that, and we don't. Well, this is one of them. But I, I will qualify it too. This is I think, one of them. you know, caregiving, like everything else, is figure outable. And, um, you know, I know that that's not mm -hmm. my word, that's Marie Forleo's word, but, you know, it is figure outable if we can just stay present and respond instead of react, which is tough when you're in crisis, but you know, it's doable. Right. It's not some, you know, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Thankfully, it's, cause I don't it, it do really, that. It, <laughs> oh my gosh. We talk the same not lingo. Not it's amazing. <laughs> it, 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 right. It's, uh, it's just a, it, it, like in anything else yeah. in life, when, uh, emotions get tangled up in the decision-making mm -hmm. process it, it and then you're dealing with unfamiliar professions per se that's when you know that's that's why we do these shows that's why we advocate after caregiving is over because we under you know we understand absolutely it's so true so I'd like to hear a little bit about your books, and, uh, and I, I want to be comforted in my journey, too. <laughs> All right. Um, so the books are kind of interesting, at least from my perspective in writing them, because I, I initially envisioned two books. One would be kind of about my experience with my dad and Alzheimer's, and one would be the care side. Mm -hmm. Well, it popped into three because I realized that some people enter the arena at end of, facing end of life for someone. They don't need the care piece per se. Right. They're already looking at right. the end of life. And some people need the care piece. Right. And then, so the, the books are reference books, and they've got an incredibly detailed um, table of contents. So you can get in. You can read. My goal was to have a chapter be a couple pages, two, three pages. Some are a little bit longer because that's just the way it went. But they're easy access. Right. And um, they're story woven in because I think story gives credence to why certain, we, my family made certain choices and I'm sharing our choices. That doesn't mean there's somebody else's choices, but it shows the rationale behind a choice and why someone else might make a different choice. Um, and so the uh, first book that I actually started writing was the one about my dad and Alzheimer's. And it's kind of, I would look at it this way. There's the um, end of life and the care books and the, Alzheimer's slash dementia book kind of sits on top. It's an extra layer of if this is what you're dealing with, this is what happens. But the book is called The Most Meaningful Life, My Dad and Alzheimer's. And I chose to write it because my experience, I feel our experience with Alzheimer's was very different than most. Um, somebody, mm -hmm. so let me just share this with you quickly. When I launched this business, I sent an email out to friends. And I got two handwritten notes back. In this day and age, I got handwritten notes. Both of them said, now remember, my mom had right. stage four cancer. Both of them said, I'm sorry your dad had Alzheimer's. And honestly, I didn't, I held it, I read it, and I didn't know how to respond. So I put it down and I moved on and I got the second one. And one day I realized, I'm not sorry my dad had Alzheimer's. He lived successfully, wow. lived a meaningful life for probably 20 years with it. The last time my dad was conscious, four days before he passed, he said something of specific meaning to each of my sisters and I and my mom. I think that's success. Um, we remained engaged, he remained engaged with us. Did it take a lot of work? Yes, did we know what we were doing? Not really, we, tr tr we uh, trusted ourselves. But I wanted to say to people that if it can happen for one family, it can happen for another may not be able to happen for everybody or a piece of what we got. So that was really the, the catalyst to everything. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote um, Peaceful Endings, um, Guiding the Walk to the End of Life and Beyond. And it goes into everything from pre-planning for end of life through actual transition and what that's like through estate settlement. And it's pretty, I'm a bullet point kind of girl. Right. And so it's pretty bullet, bullet pointed. But it's... I mean, it oh. tells people what it's like because people are afraid to ask. Our country denies death. People, it, it, there's oh. something about our Western culture that just, we just don't, we, we, 
Uh, we just no. don't have these conversations. I, you know, I was fortunate with Richard. We, yeah. I knew, uh, I knew everything he wanted at end of life, and what that did, and uh, for for both of us, is it made a very difficult experience just a tad bit easier, because any decision I made, I never had to second guess myself because I I was making it on his yes. behalf. And what he wanted, not what, what I wanted. What a gift wanted. for you. And, you know, people will say, why well, don't ask me why I think people are so um, reticent to do end of life planning. And I think one, it, it, it brings up mortality, not for the, only for that person, but for ourselves. Nobody likes to look at that. But I tell right. them, what if you reframed it as the greatest gift that person could give their survivors? Their survivors don't have to stand there and oh. guess. Goodness gracious, St. Ignatius. You know, it is the yes. biggest gift. Just do it young and then modify it, those milestones. And always, that's always there for someone who's going to have to make choices that are difficult at best. And if you've already outlined it, it's not that hard. I mean, it's hard emotionally, but yeah. It's not that yeah. hard. And, I, you know, yeah. you talk about death in our culture. Think about what we do when we bring a soul into the planet. We celebrate. We do gender reveals, we do water births, we do doulas, we do all of these things. And then, oh my gosh, this baby's born and everybody brings food over to the family and all these things. We don't even talk about what happens in the soul leaves. I mean, it's just, and I, that's one of my sweet spots. I love talking about that. But um, So Alzheimer's, end of life, and then the Dignified Care um, book is Through the Rabbit Hole, Navigating the Maze of... Um, Oh, dear, I forgot my own name. Oh, see, this is what I do. Uh, navigating the maze of providing care. It's a quick guide to care options and decisions, and it's very bullet-pointed as well. Um, you know, you should be able to get in and find a topic and if I have any information about that topic. So those are the three books. They can be, you know, valuable separately, together. Um, but again, they were written because we had my sisters and I had to learn all of them. We had to figure it out. It was like a puzzle going together. And I thought, you know what? I can just put these in little nuggets for people. And it doesn't have to be the overwhelm of, you know, I have to know all this. No, you don't. You just need to know the next piece. And it's okay. You can put the book down. You know it's there. You just need just to know step, the, next the next piece. piece the next decision. Right. The next choice. So. And, and having the reference readily available for when you need it. There's, again, there's some comfort in your journey when you know mm -hmm. that there's something there that you can, that you can relate to and refer to. In I mean, a it's time funny of you crisis. say that because I hope that people get out of that out of it. Because for me, the books almost wrote themselves. They went from first word to published in 16 months, and I had had you know publishers tell me it couldn't be done in four years. It was like a purge because I knew once it was on paper. I could look it up in the book. I didn't have to remember mm -hmm. anymore. People would come to me and say, well, what did you do about this? I don't know. Let's look it up in right. the book. You know, it was this great relief. So I do hope that people who, who have the books know that they, they're just there on the end table or the counter or whatever, and the answer is there. And people can always, if, if the answer's not in that book, because at some point I had to cut the books off, because you can continue to learn forever. They can contact me, and if I don't know the answer, I will find right. somebody who knows that answer for them. And that's another reason why it's so great to be a part of this whole network of, of advocates and caregivers, because we, we all reach out to one another and we can share information. And it, it's yeah. like this community does not work. And in you're silos. right; you hit the right word, and I got to start that. This is not a care. Um, industry as far as what we do it's a community and you know the earlier part of my life i worked in a highly competitive mm -hmm. industry um and one of my greatest surprises and joys was when i started to learn the resource what i would call a resource side of the care industry i was stunned every single person said let me introduce you to these five people you need to talk to this person this person they were connecting and there was, it was just like people had gone through this tunnel and came out without their egos. People just want to help. I mean, seriously, it's like you get stripped. Of, well, when you do some of the stuff we have to do for caregiving, that exactly. ego goes pretty fast. 
Oh, yeah. go goes goes by very fast when you're when you're in tune to advocacy, and when you think about it, uh, you know, advocacy really is Absolutely. job number one for every caregiver. We're advocating on be on behalf of of the person that's entrusted in, in your care, and and uh, it, whether it's your first experience or well, no, advocate advocacy. And then one A is self care, which is a whole other, <laughs> a other whole other piece of the puzzle, whole other piece of the puzzle. But that's you know that's that's why I think this community is so readily yes. available to share. And you know, every once in a while, you come across somebody that's not that has their silo up, but then you just know that you just kind of move on because there's another person down the road that you can reach out to that can provide that critical information that 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 particular situation. I think that's an important, important thing you just said. And I'll use an analogy here. I teach a um, dance movement based fitness class. And I would say, in my experience of other classes, modalities, this one is really, really um, susceptible to the class being different based on each teacher. There's a lot of energy work in it. So people come to my class and I say, try my class three times. And if you are not happy mm -hmm. with it, if it's not a good fit, come to me and I'll help you find a good fit. And so I think for, you know, people listening to your show, in all aspects of care, whether it's in-home health care person that comes in, an RN, a hospice person, anybody on your team, it is incredibly important that it be a good fit. And, you know, I think people are, are hesitant to say, well, this isn't a good fit because they don't know if they can find a replacement. We'll call any one of us. We'll help you find the right fit. Yeah, because they're out there. There's every, we'll it's like a find. radio station. Yeah. You know, sure. there's many different shows on that dial. You have a show, I have a show. I, I mean, Susie does. I, I am not the end all to everybody. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> and so I am happy to help them find the radio station, literally and figuratively, that's their fit. Right. It, it, the, the analogy is spot on because uh, mm -hmm. not, you know, we might like a channel, but we're not going to like all the shows on that channel. But that doesn't mean we don't tell anybody yeah. to watch that watch or listen to that channel because they could be informed about, they, you know, everybody personalities. People connect Absolutely. for different reasons. And, you know, the important thing is to get the information out so that people can... <laughs> can find comfort in their journey. I just, I'm just loving that. How come <laughs> finding comfort in their journey? That is, that is spot on. Sure. So, but I, I want to come back to something and I maybe, I want to make sure I heard this correctly and maybe <laughs> if not, I'm sure I'll be corrected, but that's Usually okay that too. Picky, but okay. <laughs> I understand that you and your sisters were caring for your mm -hmm. father who had Alzheimer's and then uh, you had mentioned yes. your mother had had cancer as well. Was that simultaneously well, that was or was that typical, one after the other? Um, it happens to Trish this way all the time, style. So my dad had probably, let's see, about, the, uh, hmm, okay, let me back up. 2012, my husband and I moved across the country to Colorado where my parents lived. And I, you know, I, we wanted to be by the mountains and have fun and play and all of this. And I thought we had quite a few years before my parents might need some care and I was willing to be here and, you know, I was just going to be a daughter. And 40, within 48 hours, about 24 hours after we moved here, we went to Barcelona to visit my daughter in school. And within 48 hours, my dad had gone into medical crisis. He'd been treated, <gasps> oh, I'm going to guess, about, he'd been taking medication for Alzheimer's for about 10 years and doing very well, um, which means he'd been living with it probably mm -hmm. at that point about mm, 17, 18 years, I'm going to guess, before he actually got medicated. Um and he went into medical crisis and a five day skilled rehab stay turned into 63 days of 24 seven sheer hell it was our entry and introduction to patient advocacy he was mismedicated over medicated he was literally legally kidnapped and he um the place he was in actually committed fraud based on his record so yeah it was a special boom so okay we did that for 63 days and then my dad wanted to go up to um a place that my parents had in the mountains and one sister and i did 24 7 tagged in seven days no sleep tagged out went home 
for 10 weeks. And then I suggested to my mom that possibly it was time. My mom was, my mom had taken care of my dad for nine years, overseen at nine, 10 years of medication. Didn't want the daughters. She's like, no, that's my responsibility. Wow. I can do it myself. My mom's, I, you know, I can do it myself. Super strong I don't need woman. any help. And then um, we said, well, you know, not for you, but for us, could we have somebody come in and help with dad? And she went, went for that. Well, four months later, we had made Christmas cookies as a family, the females, and she was fine. And 30 hours later, she was in the hospital. It was somewhere, and I'd have to look up, between 8 and 14 life-threatening things overnight. And so from that point, my dad had been, we'd been like kind of in medical heightened care crisis for six months. She went into it. She wasn't diagnosed at first. They, they, honestly, they missed the diagnosis then. <laughs> So it was about six months later that they caught their diagnosis with my mom. But at that, prior to my mom being um, diagnosed, we had two 24-hour caregivers. One did four days a week, one did three, lived there. So if my dad got up in the night, my mom could get some sleep, you know, kind of just overseeing, plus helping my mom. My mom, my dad's right. um, challenges were cognitive, and my mom's were physical. She was, her last day on earth, she was sharper than I will ever be. You know, mentally, um, but arthritis. She'd used right. her body well, and so you know we could get the caregivers in there to help dad, but also make some meals and help my mom with the physical stuff. Um, so, yeah, 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 right. yeah, absolutely. Kind of on the side without her really realizing. Um, my dad what lived <laughs> another nine months or so <laughs> from that point. Um, from the time my mom went into medical crisis, it was about another two years, maybe. But yeah, we had them both in crisis at the same time. So we actually ran mm -hmm. two 24 caregivers and then we ran two 12 hour shifts. So we always had two 24 hour schedules going, which was a little crazy. So it was a little crazy. So you, 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 yes. were, dual, you were dealing with dual caregiving situations. One Correct. with uh, your, your father with Alzheimer's and your mother with cancer and I, I'd be I'd be interested to know from your perspective obviously what were the what were the similarities and what were the differences from deal caring for somebody with uh, um, you know different with my dad with Alzheimer's it was cognitive you know physically it was pretty capable um, my right. mom was capable physically, but she was in a lot of pain. Not from the stage four cancer, just the arthritis that started with it. Um, as far as her having stage four cancer, you would never have known. Uh, she ended up having a colostomy, so that was an entirely different care issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up, let's just, let me word it this way. My mom, my mom went from a regular hospital. You know, the business model for a regular hospital is seven days. They want you out, boom. They excel at saving lives. They excel at surgery. On day 17, we still they still right. can't discharge her because she's too sick. They want her out of there, but she's too sick for skilled nursing. So I learned about something called an LTAC, which is a long-term acute care hospital. It's a whole different business model. The sweet spot is 25 days. Sorry? A whole different business model. Oh, a whole different business model. A whole different business model, and again, another uh, yeah. another example of why it's so important to share these stories because most people would not have known that until unless they right. were in the middle of a crisis. No, that's fine. Interject. So Altec I'll, is one I'll of give my you favorite back the tips, but. Or, you know, secrets to tell people. <laughs> but um, they wanted to send her home. Um, I don't know how specific to be here, but they wanted to send her home. Um, I'll just say it with a Foley catheter. I knew she would never get off of it if they did. And I said, no, you're going to teach us how to take care of this. So oh in an gosh. LTAC, they tend to round like the old-fashioned rounding right. of doctors. And I'm standing in the hallway one day, and they're all coming. And I can hear from down the hall, is that the family? And I went, yes, we are. <laughs> because they knew that meant they were going to have to walk in that room and teach us how <laughs> to take care of my mom without that catheter in there. Well, most exactly. families don't want to do anything. Which is what they're supposed to do. But, you know, minimally invasive in this case. And so they, I guess I would say right. my mm -hmm. mom's care was much more physical. And she went home from the hospital that first time she went in with C. diff, which if anybody knows mm -hmm. what that is, it's a highly communicable 
bacteria, I think it is. Um, and so they didn't even want to send my mom home because they're like, well, your dad's there. He'll get sick. We had 15 people in the family coming through all the time. We had nine caregivers on the schedule. I said, no, 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 no. We can figure this out. Um, so we had to come up with protocols for that. So my mom's was very physical, very um, medical oriented. My dad's was primarily keeping him safe and engaged mm -hmm. um, from a cognitive perspective. Very, very different experiences, apples and oranges. The same was that we had a common very thread different. of our goal was to protect their dignity, their respect, to keep them safe, to honor their wishes. Um, right. Yeah, and to provide the best care that we could, the most dignified care that we could all the way through their last breaths. So that was kind of the commonality. And two very different skill sets and problem solving. Yeah, and I, I really do appreciate you sharing this because we often get asked the question, you know, well, what's different about caring for somebody that has Alzheimer's, dementia versus another diagnosis mm -hmm. and caregiving? And, and you're one of the few people I've talked to that did it both simultaneously. So I think that uh, the information yeah. and the experience is invaluable for people who are who are out there doing the same thing that you did and another another proof of why it's so important to share these really special moments two things i think you know at some point because it was the way it was i remember driving over to their house one morning thinking i've been put in a, into a lab this is an experience i'm supposed <laughs> yes. to learn how to do this how to do this mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it was it was kind of weird. But can I just put in a, a momentary plug for one of your previous guests? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for anyone who is is um, helping someone living with dementia, any form, you know, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. It's seventy percent of all dementias. Look up Judy Cornish and the the Dawn Method, because I could not be more aligned with her approach to working with somebody, helping somebody living with dementia, and. When she and I first had our, our initial meeting conversation, I would describe what we did and she'd say, oh, this is this, this is, and that's a piece yeah. of this. Yeah. And she had the language for what we were intuitively doing. Right. So you asked the difference in the care experience between my mom and my dad. One of the things, it wasn't really a difference in care, but it was an observation of importance. My dad was able to access his cellular memory. It wasn't as important with my mom because she had she all had the it. full memory. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about cellular memory, my dad is in the um, the University of Denver Athletic Hall of Fame for both tennis and basketball. And we had a caregiver come to our house and she had one of these orange balls like you played with in gym class. And she's like, I'm going to play with your dad. And I went, oh, <laughs> bad, bad for me. I went, oh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> She threw it, and my dad's hands flew up and caught it. And he threw it back. She did it again. About the third or fourth time she did it, he started lacing it between his legs, around his head, around his back, as though he was playing as basketball. As though he's playing. It, it, that is such an amazing. That, I got chills. Oh, my it, gosh. I, that, yeah. I'm getting chills so, just listening to you. Because I, I can see, I mean, I have a vision of this happening. It's how, you know, because yeah. that, that, that memory of his, uh, came back to him, and it was like he was. It was, it was in it's that just moment. inside of him. He didn't need his brain. He didn't memory. need his brain. It's just was it was a natural part of his experience. Oh, thank you so much for yeah. sharing that. That must uh, that that must have been <laughs> an amazing experience for you oh. as well. Absolutely, and and what I try to share with people is that being in the trench, what I call being in the trench, where you're doing right. all the hands-on everything, right. physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, everything. Is really really challenging, mm -hmm. but is. because you're in that trench and you are present and you're there so much, you see things like I did. That yeah. I have that memory for the rest of my life. It's it it, uh, and I, yeah. and I'll I'll share this before we go to the break. And uh, I know again my listeners have heard this, but maybe you <laughs> probably haven't. But I'm going to risk it anyway. Um, you know, there's a beginning and there's two common aspects to caregiving. There's a beginning and an end. And we're not really prepared for either one of these life changing events. But I can say from personal experience, after it's over, uh, the, the good days far outweigh the bad days. 
It's just that those bad mm-hmm. days were so intense while you're in the middle of it. And that's why when it ends, and it does end for everybody, you'll cherish these special memories. And those special memories, like you've just described with the basketball, mm-hmm. are those are the things that you'll focus on. All those bad days, they won't be in the forefront. It's it's throwing the basket. I'm going to get a. I haven't thrown a basketball in years, but I'm going to get one today somehow and throw a basketball and think of you and your father <laughs> and that caregiver. So but, throw it to Frank. He'd love throw it. Throw it to Frank. So I think this is probably a a, a good time to uh, to take our break. And okay, Trish, you know, like I do for uh, all my guests, I'm going to put you on the spot when I come back. I want to know one okay. fun fact about you that I know all of our listeners are on the edge of their chair. <laughs> on the edge of their chair waiting to hear what your fun fact is. So you're listening to Healing Ties featured on the Whole Care Network and UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Christopher McClellan and you who know me as the Bowtie Guy on Healing Ties 2.0. We visit with people from all over the globe who share their stories because it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause. And if you would like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story to your health, happiness, and prosperity. Coming up next week on Healing Ties. You know, I went into medicine in the first place to, for my own healing, to make sense of my experiences as a patient, um, to work with what had happened, what, with what I had experienced, um, and also to parlay that into, you know, helping others. In fact, trying not to separate the two, seeing the overlap between helping oneself and helping others. That was a sort of the zone I was looking for. And that took me into medicine, which then took me into hospice and palliative medicine very specifically. Join us next week for a wonderful and delightful conversation with Dr. B.J. Miller from Mental Health. From caregiver to care receiver to palliative care doctor, this is a story you don't want to miss. Right here on Healing Ties 2.0. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm continuing my delightful conversation with Trish Lamb, and I'm getting a lot of comfort in my journey during this conversation. <laughs> and But I'm not so sure Trish is going to be comfortable after on this next little short segment because we're putting her on the spotlight, as we do here. And we want to know one fun fact about Trish that she may have not revealed to anybody else. We're just going to kind of dig deep into the archives here. So it's the microphone's all yours, Trish. Okay. Well, I think the most fun fact, I've got a couple, but I think the most fun is that one of my nicknames, which tells you somebody else knows this, is Sharpie. And that's because my dad named the Sharpie pen. <laughs> oh, now we got to dig into this a little bit more. Your your dad named the Sharpie pen? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, pray tell, please, please. Well, my dad worked for a company called Samford, which is in still in business. And during his time, he did sales, but he also worked in the factory, and he worked with the guys in R and D. And he would. And I don't know if you guys remember. I don't know if they were actually named this. They were smelly markers, is what everybody called them. Ah, and they were different colored. They were though, smelly mar- right. markers. And right. they had the scent, right? So I'll get to the Sharpie. But one night my dad brought those home. And we sat at the dinner table smelling them, the licorice and the grape and all of that <laughs> stuff. Because he would get prototypes. And he'd say, what do you think, girls, you know? And then he went, had gone to Japan to research what became crepas here. 
they were almost like oil pastels. Right. So he went over there, but he happened to be looking into the Sharpies and they were looking for a name. He was up in R&D and they were looking for a name. He goes, it's a Sharpie. So Now, isn't that a wonderful fun fact? <laughs> isn't that a bizarre thing? <laughs> I have a Sharpie right next to me, by the way, as I... Everybody as I, has a Sharpie. Everybody has a Sharpie. So what, <laughs> <laughs> See, I just love yeah. doing these because uh, you know, usually our first segment can get kind of uh, intense and personal. And then yeah. to get a fun fact, uh, a Sharpie. I'll, ne yeah. I'll always look at Sharpies differently now. So that's... Uh, Won't I you, you <laughs> Ah, uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. But goodness. You know, one thing that we have not talked about is your radio show uh, a cup of comfort right i started um in november doing a cup of comfort uh care hero topics that nobody wants to talk about and by that i mean death nobody wants to talk about it what is it like when somebody passes um what's the difference in terminology between passes and dying and transitions and things like that i love talking about that um, so that's what it means, you know, care hero topics that nobody wants to talk about. Questions that people don't want to ask. They're embarrassed. Right. There's nothing They're to be embarrassed, embarrassed about. You know, it's life. It's not going to happen yeah. to me. I'm not going to have to worry about it. No. Well, I know one thing for sure. We all go through it. We all <laughs> go through it. Nobody gets out alive. Right. Um, so we, we talk about any, any care hero topic today. Um, I had a guest on that was talking about self-care, and it's such a... Uh, loaded topic. The term is yes, so it, it, it is very Yes, loaded. it is. <laughs> I mean, you could what do, do you mean self-care? I'm too busy caring for somebody else. Oh, I can't Tom, take care of myself. It's selfish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's and selfish. It's, the bottom line <laughs> is it's self-love and it can be done in three seconds. And right. So, um, yeah, that's a cup of comfort and I have had a lot of uh, fun doing that. It's on twice a month. And uh, people can find out information on the Care Hero Radio page of my website, which is Trish Laub, L A U B as in boy dot com. So thank you for asking. And yes. you know, it's just another uh, station on the radio. You know, people can tune into that or tune into everybody. I mean, there's just so many options out there for people, and that's mine is just one flavor. And you it's know, just one flavor and one one thing. beautiful <laughs> cup. Yeah, one beautiful cup, and I. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell our listeners, and I'm really thrilled that you've joined the Whole Care Network as well, and yes, your landing page absolutely. is up and running. You know, we're still we're still in beta, but uh, you know, your page is actually one of. The, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this with some of the other folks, but your page is one of the best. So I had good uh, we, guidance from you. <laughs> I, well, but no, we really appreciate uh, you being a part and sharing your journey because it. Uh, you know, it, you know, we're not in silos. We're we're sharing, we're sharing vital information for people can be comfort in their journey. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Yeah. So if if uh, you had a magic wand, and you yeah. wanted to spread your comfort, a message of comfort, to folks who are listening today, what uh, what would that be? My message of comfort. Um, it's going to be all right. This is a part of life. You know, um, the chances are, wow, if you really look at the statistics out there, everybody's going to either is a caregiver, going to be one, has been one, or going to need one. That's Rosalind Carter's very poorly stated. That's Rosalind stated. Carter, yeah. It is very poorly stated, not in the right order, but you get the gist of it. Um, but we get the gist of it, know, that's right. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would say, embrace it. Embrace it. Mm -hmm. I think that providing care for another person is the opportunity of a lifetime. Now, not everybody wants to take that opportunity, but the opportunity is here. Right. It is to step in and find out exactly what you are made out of. Exactly how strong you are. Exactly how capable you are of staying in your lane and staying focused. And if you do that and you do your best, there's nothing you can't do and you will not have regrets at the end. So I guess that's my cup of there, comfort for people or my you know, comfort in their journey. Just 
yeah. I mean, I'm feeling the comfort right now because I, I, I think we would both agree there's no greater honor bestowed on oh. us than to be entrusted in the care of somebody else, especially at the time when life transitions. Absolutely. It is an honor and it is an, a privilege of a magnitude. I don't know that, you know, I would say that it's pretty close to bringing a life in, into the world. But this is magnitudes greater because it's just, there's a lifetime of, of it's, energy it's and experience providing, with that. Right. There's no greater happy honor sunsets. or privilege than to provide comfort to that person as they're leaving our plane. Boy, no, probably connect. no greater responsibility too. And, and, exactly. and, and I want to qualify this. Not everybody can step into that. And that's not a shortcoming. It's People not a have shortcoming. Skill sets. I would. N if you told me ten years ago my wheelhouse was going to be dementia care and end of life, I would have looked at you and said, "Are you joking me?" But that is my wheelhouse. Yeah, be. Yeah, be cognizant of what you like to do, what you can do, and it's okay to say that you can't do something. Absolutely. What's kind of not okay is to commit to something and not do it. Have your because you're it. uncomfortable mm -hmm. with it. Yeah, you have to. You know, that's why it's, again, that's another reason why we have these conversations. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Because we've been there. But Trish, again, let, let all our listeners know how they can be in touch with you okay. and, and so they can find more comfort in their, in their journey. <laughs> you're so good at that. <laughs> um, you can find everything and probably way more than you ever wanted to know about me on Trish, T-R-I-S-H, Laub, L-A-U-B as in boy, dot com. And there's information about my book series. And then I have, um, I do workshops and presentations as well as some consulting based on the content of the books and what I have learned since. Uh, sometimes I get a request for a consultation and I refer them to somebody else because I think it's a better fit. Um, as you so graciously mentioned, there's a Care Hero Radio page on my website. And there's also a membership site that allows people to go in and have access to all the content of the books, every article I've written, pretty much anything I've said and done, and it's searchable, which I think is another, you know, uh, quick access key for people. Um, but there's, you know, you can go on the website on the um, for the media page and read a sample chapter if you want to see what the book is like, see the table of contents. And also you can contact me, and I have helped a lot of people. They've just gotten to me with a quick question. Oh, my gosh, I'm drowning. I don't know what to do about this. Can you help me? Sure. I can take a few minutes and write you, you know, point you in the right direction. And I should say the work that I do is not meant, is certainly not meant to be the end all to everything. I don't know what your circumstances are. I don't know what your constraints are, what your limitations, what your abilities are. But what I can do is point you in the right direction. So that's kind of what I do. You know, Trish, with the great work that you're doing and the comfort that you're providing in people's journeys, you are certainly someone who's creating healing ties all around us. And I can't thank you enough for joining me today. And I am just looking forward to collaborating with you on, on more episodes of Healing Ties in the future. So thanks. Thanks again. Oh, it, it, my pleasure. And thanks go to you. So it's always so fun to talk with you. I just love it when caregivers share their story to help other caregivers just like Trish has. And I know I enjoyed my cup of comfort today with Trish, and I hope you did too. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story on Healing Ties. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Healing Ties. As you know, I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by being with awesome people like you. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We'll see you for another episode real soon. Take care. Bye for now.